Good afternoon. There is no commercial support for today's activity. The speakers and planners have disclosed no relevant financial relationships with any commercial interest. You will receive a SurveyMonkey link after today's activity. If you are viewing online, the evaluation link will be listed in the links icon at the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions, please enter it into the Q&A chat and we will ask it at the end of the presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kapana Prasad and Dr. Andrea Huntley. Dr. Prasad is our founding program director of our psychiatry residency program. She attended medical school at King George Medical College at Lucknow, India. After medical school, she moved to England and completed British psychiatry residency and then moved to the USA and finished her training at Drexel University in Philadelphia. From 2000 to 2014, Dr. Prasad worked as a medical director at the inpatient mental health unit and then as an outpatient clinic director. She was the city appointed psychiatry consultant to several federally qualified health centers. She moved to Georgia in 2015, where she worked at Atlanta VA Medical Center and became an assistant professor with Emory University School of Medicine. She supervised the outpatient resident clinic for Emory residents and taught at the Emory School of Medicine. She is the past president of the Indo-American Psychiatric Association of Georgia and served as a member of the Board of Trustees with the Georgia Psychiatric Physicians Association and is the chair of the International Psychiatry Committee. In September of 2020, Dr. Prasad began with NGHS in her new role as the program director of psychiatry residency. Dr. Prasad has done several workshops and has been an invited speaker at various community and academic centers. Dr. Andrea Huntley is the Associate Program Director for Northeast Georgia Health System Psychiatry Residency and Outpatient Child and Adolescent Psychiatrist, um, practicing at Northeast Georgia Provider Groups in Gainesville and Dawsonville. Dr. Huntley assisted with building the residency program to train new psychiatrists to work in the community and rural health. Dr. Huntley graduated medical school from the University of Arkansas and has an MPH from the University of Alabama in Birmingham in epidemiology. She completed her re uh, psychiatry residency and child and adolescent fellowship at the University of Kentucky. Prior to her position at NGHS, Dr. Huntley previously practiced in rural Alabama in the Community Mental Health Center for 11 years. Dr. Huntley is a board certified in adult and child and adolescent uh, psychiatrist. So please join me in welcoming both Dr. Prasad and uh, Dr. Huntley on today's talk. Thank you all for um, having me here. So today's topic is to help understand the bias in treating substance use and also then changing the bias in treating substance use. And the goal is ultimately to improve the understanding as well as the treatment in substance use disorder. So moving forward, the objectives of today's talk, one is to understand the definition and types of stigma related to substance use disorder. Two, appreciate the damaging effects of stigma regarding substance use disorders. Three, understand how stigma related to substance use can influence public, patients, trainees, and professionals in multidisciplinary setting. To gain an understanding of the neurobiology of substance use disorder and the disease model of addiction. And then we will also together do a reflection exercise as a tool to address stigma moving forwards. So hopefully um, we can all work together on reducing and understanding the stigma associated with substance use. So this, I didn't require much uh, search in finding George. Um, we all know a George in work in our hospital setting as well as in clinic settings, or even if we are not a clinician, on this, you know, Gainesville Square, we have seen several George. So this is George. He is a 45-year-old homeless man brought to the ER, found unconscious in the street smelling of alcohol. 
We learned from the electronic medical record that he's well known in the ER. He has been evaluated and treated twice in the last three months alone for alcohol related issues. Guess what? Total of 10 visits to the ER in this year, all related to drugs and alcohol, and three of these visits resulted in admissions to the medical floor for complicated alcohol and drug withdrawal. So um, when you see him, when you see his history, the chances are possibly, you know, our eyebrows raise. We say, oh, it's George again, right? So let's see what happens next with George. He has been referred to rehab facilities. He leaves against medical advice. Two different rehab facilities even don't want him. They have blacklisted him because he has been verbally aggressive to the patients at the facility. And then he also tends to te test positive for cocaine, Xanax, and narcotics. According to George, substance of choice is alcohol. He also has some anxiety and suicidal ideas. And he's reported in the past to being prescribed you know, Doc, the only thing that works for me is Xanax and Ativan for my anxiety. So uh, the reason why I'm saying it is I think most of us may have heard this before. So it shows somewhat of a bias we have formed in our own mind. So anyway, once sober, he tends to uh, demand discharge after being admitted. So what shall we do with him this time? You enter the ER, his BL was 0 0.41, then it reduces to 0 0.2. UDS is negative this time. However, heart rate is high. Blood pressure is kind of okay, but the problem is he's feeling cold and very anxious. Um, so I don't know what about others, but feeling cold and anxious sometimes is a sign of withdrawal. So he starts to become verbally aggressive and uh, demands to be discharged and the nurses at the back are probably talking, the clinicians are discussing, oh, he just wants to get his alcohol now. So shall we let him go or shall we admit him? So those are the kind of scenario I have just painted for you. So at this point, if I could ask people to reflect in their mind and see that what does this individual story have you thinking about substance abuse? If you could possibly rewrite the narrative of George in any way, what would you change? And then at the end of it, at the end of the session, we will try to you know, capture the essence of what do you think would have to happen for this change to take place. So these are some reflection questions. And at the end of the talk, we'll probably um, you know, try to rewrite this narrative. But the terms of alcoholic, what a waste of my time, what a waste of hospital and rehab resources. Possibly George is a loser. He must be so weak. Uh, that George, if those terms are coming in your mind or you've met people for whom this is a common terminology, then we need to possibly reflect on our own and the structural stigma. So. The fact is that 80% of Americans who needed treatment didn't receive it. And often people don't seek treatment because of the stigma and bias. And I'm not at all finger pointing at me, you or anybody here. I am just even talking about stigma people have against themselves. Families having stigma of patients with substance use disorder. The false beliefs and the negative attitudes surrounding substance use disorder, stigma and bias restrict access to care and negatively impact health. Stigma is present in social and work settings and is also found in healthcare and social services. We have seen that it may deter help-seeking behavior amongst individuals with substance use disorder and their families. So at this, I'll just take a two minute digress and talk about Sarah, a nice 17 year old girl from a really nice regular family who attempted suicide and was seen in the ER. When the attempt was not complete and it was, she came about. So to the ER people, what she said was, she would rather die than the family to know that she was using substances and trading sexual favors to obtain the drugs. Sarah reported that the shame of this was worse than the thought of dying. So 
I think, again, perhaps most of us have seen a Sarah in our lives, in the hospital, in our social settings, perhaps in a family. But I just wanted to point out that sometimes patients themselves have a lot of stigma around substance use and not even being aware that this is a disorder and there may be treatment for it. So what is bias? The bias against people with substance use disorder, like I mentioned, is a negative attitude and stereotype. Um, we know that substance use disorder are chronic, treatable medical condition. But how many other people know and how many times we forget is what this talk is about. Um, many people don't even know that substance use disorder is the result of the changes in the brain. There are neurotransmitters uh, involved. There are brains areas involved. And by affecting them, we can hopefully decrease the compulsive, difficult to, or impossible uh, attempt to stop with adi without adequate support. So once we help the patient realize that we can possibly stop, um, but you will need adequate support, it becomes an optimistic situation for them. So some people with severe substance disuse uh, disorder become aggressive, they lie, they steal to support their drug problem or during withdrawal, and then they further alienate themselves from family, friends, and society. And this goes on to the public stigma where now certain negative stereotypes have happened around substance use. So um, that's the picture I'm raising. And now to define the types of stigma and bias. So we talked about public stigma. That's the negative attitude and prejudice against people with substance use disorder. Then there's also structural stigma. So with the structural stigma, I mean the laws, the policies, the practices, and that results sometimes in some of these folks being locked up or being forced into programs where they don't want to be, and then they leave against advice. So a lot of structural stigma then the self-stigma, I think I talked to you about, Sarah, about that to help you understand what that internalized shame is. Then amongst the healthcare providers, there is significant stigma, not just against people who are substance users, but also specific stigma against medications being introduced now for treatment of substance use disorder. So I don't have numbers but it's at least rampant that 25 to 40 percent of the providers sometimes frown upon methadone, suboxone, vivitrol, naltrexone. So a lot of medication assisted treatment available. Um, healthcare providers are known to have stigma against those medications also. So taking each one by one without boring you enough, I will try to address it. So stigma can affect the social response to substance use disorder and influence how individuals with substance use disorder view themselves. So this is something which I don't ever would wish on anybody, but it's happening every day. And it happens today as we speak, there are several suicides. Um, I'll use the example of the veterans. I'll use the example of people in Vietnam who were forced to use heroin because they did not have any way, any respite uh, for their pain or for the traumas they were witnessing. So they became addicted. And then what happened when they came back? They inflicted stigma on themselves and some society members also had stigma against them. So this is a very sensitive topic, but it's still rampant today. Structural stigma, um, we can have a whole lecture on this about uh, structural stigma, but the bottom line is let's all work together against disabling the label. So disable the label by implementing appropriate policies, procedures, and rules in an institution. Um, we don't want to limit the opportunities for the members of the stigmatized group. So um, just the fact that here in Hall County, we have a court system which addresses people separately with just drug and alcohol use disorder or mental health disorder. And if they have had petty crimes, then perhaps putting them in the jail is not the best idea. What else can we do about it? So um, this is the structural stigma that we've talked about, that people are working and policies are being made. But unless that is done, 
it's still a problem. Social stigma, large social groups endorsing stereotypes about stigmatized group. So this word, people who are addicted are lazy, selfish, and should be punished. Uh, the other wor word which I hear a lot is they are weak. So it's a weakness that they can't snap out of it. They are weak that they still keep using heroin. They are weak because they turn to alcohol when they're happy. They turn to alcohol when they're sad. They turn to alcohol when they're angry. Can't they snap out of it? So um, this is the social stigma we are talking about. Lazy, selfish, should be punished because they will commit crime now. And then the self-stigma, I think I have talked enough about that let's label jars, not people. Um, negative feelings about oneself and their maladaptive behavior. This causes an identity transformation resulting from the patient's experiences, perceptions, anticipation of negative social responses from the family, from the community. Um, so they start also believing that I'm selfish and lazy because I abuse drugs. Um, I will try to focus on more attention on the healthcare provider attitudes as well as um, the area where we work. So healthcare provider attitudes is providers may refuse to offer services or pharmacologic treatment for other medical illnesses. So um, how can we treat the diabetes because you are alcoholic and you're not even eating? These views can influence poor provision of care and then the biggest problem is that individuals hide their substance use problem. I cannot tell you how much RCL service is busy on the withdrawal because when they go through surgery and they have chosen not to tell their providers that they are using opiates or they're using cocaine or they're using alcohol and then they go into withdrawal when they're put in the hospital, that leads to them not telling anybody still but by running away, that affects the physical, mental, as well as the resources, every health system. Um, that leads to overuse system resources, and ultimately they are not rested in their own health. So it leads to the burnout of the doctors, it leads to the burnout of the nurses, the social workers, the clinicians, and the system. Don't forget the dollar amounts that goes into it. Um, sometimes then we end up seeing that the patients of substance use disorder abuse the system through drug seeking, uh, behavior, diversion, and failure to adhere to recommended care. One study actually documented that physicians in practice do not like working with patients with substance use disorder. They prefer not to screen people with that because they feel that what if it comes positive, then I don't have the skills to treat them. So the lack of expertise along with lack of workforce, which we have seen rampant everywhere, plays a big role in this also. Multiple studies have reported physicians' failure to diagnose substance use disorder and provide appropriate care. So uh, that's something we have to focus on about the healthcare provider attitudes. And as I promised, uh, physician-related attitudes, here we come. Attitudes may be reinforced by perceived lack of skills, resources, and time to care for patients. Actually, I should have put physician and nurses. Um, so my mistake, but please assume that this is physician and nurses. Reinforcement of societal attitudes, attitudes of other clinicians, their own fear of failure, and difficulty connecting with the patient. So uh, I'll talk more about this, but I have been talking to you about adults, and at this stage, I think working on the terminology, working on also some of the issues um, around children and adolescents, teenagers, our Gen Zs, um, I wanted to talk about that, but since I'm not a child and adolescent psychiatrist, I will turn it over to Dr. Huntley, who will not only talk about the child and adolescence, the terminology, but also explain the biopsychosocial model of substance use disorder. So um, when the structural stigma, which I'm talking, White House Office of National Drug Control Policy actually prepared a document for federal agencies about terminology. So I'm hoping people will pay attention on the terminology and begin to use it as of today afternoon. So let's see.
Um, but I will turn it over to Dr. Huntley. Thank you. And I'll come back. Thank you. Well, I'm Dr. Andrea Huntley. I am a child adolescent psychiatrist. And so, and I've been uh, practicing in child adolescent psychiatry for about 13 years. Um, before I came here, I was in community mental health um, for a little over a decade, and then I've been here for three years. And now I'm also the associate program director. But one thing I've always, and I think it's a great thing for us to talk about stigma, in the previous environment I worked in was a community mental health center. And I would have a lot of people that wouldn't come to see me because of the stigma of mental health. And one of the things that drew me to NGHS was the integrative care where we have psychiatrists integrated in our clinics. So it helps with that stigma for mental health, but also substance abuse. But when we think about substance abuse, and I had a patient in my office a couple weeks ago that was really struggling, there are so many factors to think about. And even though I am a child psychiatrist and I'm supposed to be the expert, I understand how other providers feel that are in primary care when you see someone with substance abuse, like, goodness, what do we do? Where do we go with this? And then especially an adolescent. You know, there's so many things going on. I mean, and what factors can we look at? And when we're working with residents, I even sometimes get residents to ask me going, how do I, this is a problem, this is a problem, where do we go with this and this and this? And sometimes we say, let's just stop and let's look at it. And one way we always, we teach our residents is using the biopsychosocial model when you're treating patients, because all these need to be addressed. You know, one thing that's very important in psychiatry is our social history and also substance abuse is always something we introduce. But we introduce this, and this is different from our practice, from most of your practices, but we look at biological issues. Some of these individuals that have substance abuse, when we're looking at adolescents or adults, their parents used to use substances, maybe substances in utero, um, their diet, their lifestyle, some comorbidity. A lot of our patients with substance abuse also have other psychiatric disorders that need to be addressed. We look at psychological, especially with well, any of our patients, but especially our adolescents. A lot of these individuals have self-esteem issues, really want to be accepted. They, they have history of trauma. We have a lot of patients with substance abuse that the trauma issue needs to be addressed. Um, coping skills, social skills. Sometimes these kids have very poor social skills and um, using substances can be part of it. And then also their environment they're in. Are they in an environment where others are using? Um, socioeconomic status, family circumstances, peer group. And so we look at this and whenever you're treating one of these patients, we try to get them to think about a formulation of how we can address all these issues because if we don't, sometimes there's other issues that go along with it. So why are we talking about adolescent substance use? Because it's a big issue. Um, adolescent substance abuse is a national public crisis. Most use substances in adolescents are nicotine, alcohol, marijuana. But one thing I did not include in here was opioids. I mean, because that one is one that we're really trying to address um, that has increased. Using nicotine, alcohol, marijuana, and other toxic substances can cause serious adverse effects on the brain because their brains are still developing at this age. And adolescents who use these substances are at greater risk for impairment, including dependency, and to endure in adulthood. Because if you're seeing someone this young that's using and possibly even having polysubstance use, it's a big concern. And how do we address it? So teens and um, alcohol and substance use, experimentation with alcohol and drugs during adolescence is very common. Teens don't really see the link. They don't see the actions they have today and the consequences of tomorrow. And that's really normal of adolescence. Um, but it gets really difficult when you think about substances. Tends to, teens tend to feel indestructible and they're immune to problems that others experience. They feel like it's not gonna happen to me. So in this slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about development of kids and then also risk factors. A big risk factor I look at is their family history of substance use because that puts them at the increased risk. So we always discuss that. Um, depression. There's always, there's usually in these patients, especially our adolescents, there's another comorbid diagnosis that can be addressed that can help with the substance issues. Low self-esteem, they want to be accepted, and that those kids that just don't fit in. 
But when we go back into our developmental models, we think about Erickson. During adolescence, youth are often experimenting with different identities, and they mold their behavior to fit the norms of the group. They want to fit in. That's part of middle school and high school. It's, this is also the time where, where kids are separating from their parents. I have some parents that really stress about this, but I mean, this is a normal stage of development. But when there's substance abuse, it gets complicated. Most of our patients have not obtained a, a mature level of cognitive, emotional, social, or physical growth. And this time of development, forming a separate identity and preparing for an appropriate societal and individual laws. What is the problem is when adolescents experiment with a wide range of attitudes behaviors, this can include using psychoactive substances. So warning signs, just something to kind of go through. This is from Facts of Families from ACAP, but just some things I kind of look at and parents look at, physical fatigue, repeated complaints, red glazed eyes, lasting, um, a lasting cough, emotional personality change, sudden mood changes, irritability, irresponsibilities, low self-esteem, poor judgment, depression, lack of interest. I have some kids that just isolate themselves in a the room and never really get out. Starting arguments, breaking rules, withdrawing from the family, school, the decreased interest, negative attitude, truancy issues, dropping grades, discipline issues that really weren't prevalent before, and then social problems. New friends are less interested in standard home and school activities. They have problems with the law and changes and less conventional styles of dress and music. So this is a slide um, and it's from um, I can't remember where I placed it from, but these are just different terms. When you read these terms, what do you think about? Because these terms are not always the best terms to use, but when we say like alcoholic, addict, pillhead, user, junkie, drunk, substance user, formal addict, or recovered addict, and you say this to an adolescent and they're still forming their identity, what's gonna happen with that? And so stigma can prevent individuals from seeking treatment and worsen recovery outcomes. Being a child adolescent psychiatrist, I am sometimes the very first provider they're seeing for mental illness or substance use. And so one thing I really try to do and what I encourage all of us to do is build that rapport and open that patient up where they, if they need treatment later on, they're open to that treatment. And I think us understanding these terms and saying it in different ways can help us engage these patients and eliminate that stigma. Adolescents are highly vulnerable to health stigma. You know, th this is a prime period of social identity. Addiction stigma persists even during recovery. It can threaten the use of social identity and identification with recovery groups. To feel socially accepted, adolescents do not, sometimes they don't want people to know their substance use. They want to hide it. They don't want to talk about it. And thus recovering adolescents may separate themselves from using identity by removing friends and isolating. And really important part of adolescent is connecting with social groups. But after the development of close social bonds as adolescents may avoid disclosure about their recovery for fear that being seen as abnormal. No one in this group wants to be seen as abnormal. They want to blend usually. And so, and during recovery, adolescents may initially struggle to form new relationships. I mean, one important thing, we don't want them to continue to associate with other peers that use, but we need to find peers that are able to identify with them that are not using. And sometimes that's really complicated in this age group, especially with the stigma. And they're less likely to engage in social networks. They have increased secrecy about their disorder. This can prevent an individual from seeking treatment, which could be worse outcomes. There's poor mental health, and there's a barrier for developing positive relationships. So if adolescents and teens at their developmental phase, they're highly vulnerable to health-related stigma. So what can we do? How can we change this? We can build rapport with these patients, but we also can change our language, which is the fabric of substance use disorder culture. Use first person language. Change shows that a person has a problem rather than the person is the problem. And avoid terms that elicit negative association, punitive attitudes, and an individual blame. And my previous slide, it's from that words that matter. So, so this, is that, this is from that. So again, when we think about these terms, alcoholic, addict, pillhead, user, junkie, drunk, substance abuser, former addict, recovered addict, 
What are different terms we could use? And it's really pretty simple. Alcoholic, person with an alcohol use disorder. An addict, a person with a substance use disorder. A pillhead, a person with a substance use disorder. A user, same thing. Junkie, a person in active use. A person's name that is in active use. Um, drunk who misuses, engages in unhealthy hazard of alcohol use. I know it's more terms, but it defines it better. A substance abuser or a drug user, they're still a patient. And so formal addict, even though that doesn't sound because they're now clean, or as that's not a great term either, it's a person in recovery or long-term recovery, or a recovered addict, a person who previously used drugs. So here's some other terminology. A lot of terminology we use is clean and dirty to say like with their drug screens. We need to change that language too. Because a person recovery, various terms can label substance use and status of people with substance users, such as clean and dirty. Um, clinically accurate or non-stigmatizing terminology that's similar is how we describe other medical conditions is strongly preferred. Instead of clean, use, ter use negative are currently not using substances. Instead of dirty, use positive. Our person is currently using substances. So, and the term for person in recovery has a range of definitions, but generally refers to a person that's stopping or at least reducing substance use to a safer level. That reflects a process of change. A person in recovery while taking medication or receiving psychosocial services. So when we're engaging our adolescents or anyone into treatment, when recovering you feel more understood by peers to engage in substance use, it might be an important insight for their caregivers who might not really understand um, why this, you continue to interact with others who are viewed as risky. They want to belong to some of them. Motivational interviewing, I'm not gonna talk about a lot because Dr. Miles and Dr. Armstrong are gonna talk about that in a couple of weeks as part of this lecture series. But this is something that has been seen to be beneficial in our adolescents and, and our adult patients. It's a patient-centered counseling, counseling style that has recently been described as a collaborative conversation style for strengthening a person's own motivation and commitment to change. It gets them involved because they need to be part of this. Um, they have to engage to make that change. And then motivational interviewing has been demonstrated to increase motivation and substance use also among adults. And I believe I'm, I'm this is back to you, Dr. Prasad, correct? Thank you, Dr. Okay. Hundley. Back to me, this is Dr. Prasad. Um, so now what can we do about it? Hopefully people have learned where um, we can make some changes, but what are the strategies to make these changes? So I think there's no point in just pointing out the problem. Let's do something about the problem. Um, so I'll be talking in the next few slides about education on the stigmatized attitudes and then exposure to maintenance. And then we'll have how can we do all those and then bringing in some mentorship. So in my opinion, as a program director, as an academician, I would like to begin um, at the root, let's start taking my colleagues in primary care. Substance use disorder comes under their social history. So when I get notes from the primary care, there is no subheading of substance use disorder. So to me, social history means who does he live with, what trauma he had, uh, what does he do, uh, getting to know the person. A substance use disorder is a medical disorder medical history or give it its own importance. So ever since Epic started having tobacco use and a billing associated with it, we are giving tobacco use suddenly a little bit more priority, but alcohol use, opiate use, marijuana use is still on the side. It's a byproduct of the history. It's not the history. So. Perhaps sometimes we can look into our notes template and we can look into making substance use disorder a topic of its own. Let's talk about medical school education. I have medical students in the audience today. Substance use disorder is lost amongst essential rotations. Teachings are about the anatomy and physiology in the first year about a lot of organic problems in the second year, 
third ear is lost rotating from clinical rotation to rotation. And I can tell you addiction rotation is not a rotation there. And then the fourth year, maybe if you're interested, you can have an elective, uh, but they are so far and beyond that that's also challenging. So my gut feeling is for our medical students that this substance use disorder training kind of gets lost. It's talked about sometimes in preventive medicine, sometimes in internal medicine. Withdrawal is given some kind of aspect of importance because they create the patients need that treatment. So maybe they talk about it, but prevention, uh, recognizing it as a disorder, keeping people in recovery is a total lost subject in education in our medical school system. I'm a program director of psychiatry and I have interviewed several program directors around the country. Um, my own program director is a very active member in ACGME and our own ACGME for four years of psychiatry residency requires only one month of substance use disorder training. So uh, I'm not saying that as a criticism, I'm just saying that because there's a fellowship in addiction medicine, sometimes people assume that people interested in substance use disorder will become a fellow, but it doesn't happen, life happens. Most of us become general psychiatrists and with just one month of training in four years, mind you, of addiction psychiatry, Perhaps we are also not best trained when we become general psychiatrists. So this time I did have the opportunity. So for my residents, we have managed to get two months of substance use, which is better than most of the norms in other places. So perhaps that could become a norm in other places also is my uh, humble suggestion. Lack of workforce and lack of expertise. Lack of workforce is everywhere. We are seeing a lack of workforce of providers everywhere, but lack of expertise, let's do something to change that because once we feel, um, then perhaps nurse practitioners, APPs, nurses, clinicians, social workers, psychologists, therapists, we'll all together form this multidisciplinary team to have decreased bias in the treatment of substance use disorder. So those were some of the thoughts which I penciled down. Um, and in this, so I like to think out of box thinking sometimes because you'd go where the need is. So like a game of chess, basically. So you can't have a pre-planned game. You have to go with the flow and go with the best expertise and the knowledge you have. So perhaps uh, introducing pharmacotherapy when we teach the course, then we can also have uh, buprenorphine training, methadone amongst pregnant women, buprenorphine amongst pregnant people, so that the next generation, the uterus, the baby in the uterus will not come across as a fetal alcohol syndrome person, or we need to be able to address the trauma. So ask that lady in preg who's pregnant, what trauma issues they've had, if they're gonna go back into that uh, field. So at least if we didn't help this generation, we can help the next generation. Education on the stigmatized attitudes, exposure to uh, recovery oriented language in healthcare settings. And I think Dr. Huntley did a great job in telling you uh, the recovery oriented language, exposure to patients in rec recovery using clinical peer specialists. And here, as uh, I hope all of you know, in Hall County with NGHS, we have a grant and we are working with clinical peer specialists and we introduce them not only to active users, but also to pregnant women and uh, other women who have had been a substance use user and uh, are scared to tell this to anybody in case DFAX takes their child away. So clinical peer specialists work with them. We also want to expose patients and also the clinicians to folks in recovery. Um, also, maybe, you know, clinicians who are seasoned clinicians in addiction psychiatry could give grand rounds to not just psychiatry, but to all. Pain medicines, we have palliative care here, we have internal medicines, so many things going on. Post-surgery, I mean, folks, I don't want iatrogenic opiate addiction. So, 
to get expertise in people on what verbiage to use so people don't get into the trap of uh, itrogenic opiate dependence. Um, that will be a great mentorship to form on. Community outreach activities in school, gyms, clubs, religious centers. Um, I think that's a great idea. We are all working with our uh, PR here to have more community outreach activities, including I think we are targeting middle schools and high schools. Um, I have a 17 year old daughter and in front of her high school, it's written hashtag no shame in addiction. JC, which is Johns Creek, supports student who want to get treatment. This is the laser billboard in front of her high school. And I'm very proud of that because at least if somebody is vaping and the next step will be marijuana, then they can go up to the school counselor without judgment and not try to hide these things. Um, and then as I promised, these are the reflection things we were going to work on. Um, so if I could possibly remind you, Mr. George and Ms. Sarah, I wanted to use that example to facilitate the development of increased awareness uh, of deeply held yet often unexamined attitudes internally um, and we'll examine and explore issues triggered by an experience which clarifies meaning to the individual and then humanize the understanding of mental health and addiction problems and enhance the compassion and understanding of these problems, right? So let me take you back to Mr. George. I want that image in your mind when you think about him and talk about him, okay? Here we are. So Mr. George is actually, and this is a presentation which I tell when you present a case, it began with 45 year old homeless man. How about a 45 year old married white male who is currently without housing, period. He used to be a successful businessman and in a happy marriage, made bad decisions, lost the business, fell into the trap of alcoholism. And since then, he has been using alcohol heavily and has been ashamed and never went back to his family. Did we get this when we talked about it? No, because remember, we all raised our eyebrows, right? So we forget the person. So we are going to treat the disorder and not make the person into the addict. So that was the hope. So if you could, I don't know if anybody wants to participate, but I would love that if someone could tell me um, if they could rewrite the narrative or perhaps um, just talk about how we can change this aspect that he comes to the ER 10 times a year, we send them to rehab or medical centers and he leaves against medical advice or gets verbally aggressive towards the nurses. What two, three tiny things can we do? A drop in the ocean can we do? to possibly change the outcome is what I'm asking you to uh, reflect. So any volunteers? Oh, I know. Well, I, I think the biggest thing for us, because this situation happens every day, um, I think a big thing for us is just being present with them and listening. I think that's so much of what doesn't happen in the ER. Everyone's so fast paced and everyone is so like, they don't want help, so let's get them out of here. But meeting them where they are and actually listening to them and, and figuring out what's going on with them in that moment, I think tends to make a difference. Thank you very much. That was a great answer. Um, if there was a billable code called empathic listening, you win the <laughs> score there. Um, so the patient um, is lacking resources in their community to feel, to handle outpatient care. So um, by not having those resources available, uh, they're utilizing the resources um, that are available to them in the emergency department. So getting them set up with a provider who um, can see them in a more appropriate setting would um, eliminate some of the cost of that utilization on the healthcare system entirely. Okay, great. that's a very good answer. Thank you for that. Um, that actually leads me to 
resources. And that's something we all would like to know. Uh, but I'll just give you one example. Um, like, you, like Dr. Walker was telling you in my introduction, I worked with the city of Philadelphia and a very, very, very famous dignitary was uh, visiting Philadelphia. And we were, I don't know if anybody's been to Philly, but our iconic building is our 30th Street Station. It looks like a palace in itself. It's beautiful, but around it are all homeless people uh, panhandling. So our job was to make the city of Philadelphia clean of all homeless uh, addicts and schizophrenics on the streets, right? So how can we do that? They don't want housing. They're happy on the streets. They don't want food. They can go through the litter and get their food. Everybody wastes so much food. So um, combining the two answers I got, listening to the person and then showing them resources, that's what we did. So we had a grant. And what we did is we asked them what you want. So we had the option of housing. They didn't want housing because housing meant rules. Housing meant boundaries. Housing meant restriction and curfews. Well, they could have stayed in their marriage and, they, and in their job if they, you know, if they could follow all those things. So they didn't want housing. So what we said is, okay, you can have the housing with no rules and no medications necessary, but whenever you want, you can come back to this housing. It's yours. So instead of t giving them, you know, ultimatums or boundaries, we just met them where they were ready to be met. So it was the month of January. We got our biggest snowstorm and they did come to that place. And when they did come to that place, they got the heating, they got the food, and then they disappeared whenever they needed their fix or whatever. And then they came back and they kept coming back. And during that process, we used the engagement. Um, as this is the assertive community treatment uh, we in psychiatry provide. Um, so we visit them where they are, we meet them where they are, we medicate when they are ready. So this is the stages of change we uh, try to meet and understand the person in. So sometimes we go upside down, sometimes we go sideward, sometimes we do other things. But what we try to do is give them, you know, it's the pivot. If you think of the signs, you know, with the fulcrum and the pivot and everything, we try to give them some pivot. With that, we bring them some belonging. With some belonging comes the engagement. With the engagement comes the recovery. So it's a long process, but it works. I cannot tell you how many times I have seen it working. And then we bring those people to talk to other folks. We train uh, the, our um, community provides, it's a free training for certified peer specialists where they run the recovery houses. So treatment is possible, recovery is possible, the practice of mindfulness, the practice of uh, meditation, the practice of uh, listening, these are the things they learn and then they teach others. So you can help break the bias, thank you so much. Put your patients first and uh, I think this is something which is near and dear to both me and Dr. Huntley. So definitely, whether it be a child, whether it be an adolescent, whether it be an adult, elderly, I had my 80 year old who was retired and wealthy say, why not? Let, I have never, I've always been a good guy. Let me try cocaine. And he tried cocaine and cocaine really did something for him and he got addicted within one month. One month he was an addict. So that's my 80 year old. Um, establish a relationship, ask your patient's health history in the context of their life experience. Don't forget, they are a person, they have their life experiences. Um, use respectful language, normalize the care, uh, provide a range of options, meet the patients where they are, be patient, offer them a range of evidence-based treatment, including MAT. But MAT is medication-assisted treatment, but one thing we don't want is to get them on MAT when they're not ready. They have to be ready and it has to be given with um, a provider and with some therapy. So promote harm reduction, overdose risk management, and that's the most important part, especially with methadone and suboxone. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Huntley to talk more about that. And then um, we'll give you the resources 
And our Laurelwood Intake Center is a great, now sorry, it's called Behavioral Health Access Center, is a great resource for resources also. Here we are. Thank you. And this is our list of resources that we have. You have access to these slides. Um, these are some different options you have. Um, Mount Sinai Recovery Center in Dahlonega, Newport Academy locations. Um, there's another website to get information of options in Hall County. Avita Community Partners Clubhouse and an Evil Overlook Adolescent Re Residential Recovery. And then also Twin Lakes Rehab Center at Talbot Center. And the last thing is questions. Well, thank you for an awesome talk on stigmatizing a language. Other than language, are there any other types of strategies that clinicians can do in regards to changing uh, stigmatizing behaviors? Well, and I think one thing you brought up, giving them time, because we see these patients in the ER and we've got this other patient, patient, and then I always talk about your pagers going off, like, wait, you don't have pagers anymore, but I remember that as a resident. Um, just, go, just sitting there and seeing where they're at and getting that relationship and engaging them. And then also, I think, not seeing if, if the patient is not doing what you asked them to do the first time, it doesn't mean they're, not, they're still in that process of change. It takes a while sometimes. We have to kind of see where they're at. And these patients, there are patients that do that. And, and when you're someone that practices and stays in the same practice for a while, you can see that transition. Eventually that patient, and that, I mean, and that is really rewarding when you see that patient, but I think really taking the time, and one thing that Dr. Prasad brought up, finding where they're at and giving them the right resources, I think can be very helpful. So, anything you would like to add to that question? I think you learn a lot more when you learn motivational interviewing skill. That will um, go really well because you have to leave the doors open so you have to move them from, no, I don't want to change, to a possible pre-contemplation, from pre-contemplation to an actual contemplation. And then it's a long process from contemplation to action. You're allowed to let them fall off the wagon. They'll come back and see how it goes. The second thing I would also say, don't try to be a hero. Um, it has to be delegated, multidisciplinary. No one person can do it all. So it's a team approach. Um, local resources in our area, like Talbots, for example, is for physicians and for pilots who have fallen under the clutches of substance use disorder. So knowing these resources, maintaining their privacy, and um, Mount Sinai, for example, has a pool. It uses acupressure. It uses horse therapy. Then Twin Lakes uses cow therapy. So they have little calves where you can, you are now responsible for the, these calves. So little things like these, people don't even know. So utilizing these things would be a great option and using team approach. Thank you. I don't see any questions online. Are there any questions in the audience or any comments? I'll get that 30-second uh, pause. There. Okay, here we go. Um, I have a question for Dr. Huntley. Um, what would you say the best age for educating kids for child adolescent about substance abuse? Is it as early as possible or um, when they kind of form the ideation of what substance abuse is? Um, I don't know if there's actually a specific age, but I think always opening that conversation. One thing I always tell families and something, and I think we kind of got it back when during the, there's negatives and positives about the pandemic. But one thing I always tell families is eat dinner together. Even if you're two busy working parents, sit down at the table and have conversations. And so kids can open that conversation. I think anytime, and when a kid has a question, answer it. You know, you know, answer those questions. And if you don't know the answer, kind of figure out, you know, we don't know all the answers. And sometimes I tell my kids that. But I think whenever, just always being available to them. But I definitely think, you know, when we talk about substance use, at, you know, middle school, high school is when those conversations happen. Um, and then sometimes it happens even earlier, especially with our families 
that have met family members that have substance abuse. So sometimes those kids have questions, why does grandparent do this? Or why does dad do this? Or why does brother do this? So oh, sometimes those kids get it opened up a little sooner, but just meet the child where they're at. Thank you, and Dr. Yusuf uh, put online fantastic presentation, Dr. Prasad and Huntley. We have enjoyed it. Any other questions anyone might have? Yes, I have another question right here. Um, quick question uh, regarding um, cultural impacts of stigma on substance use. Uh, you had mentioned that that was a component of kind of the proliferation of uh, the stigmatization of substance use. Um, in both of y'all's experience, um, what techniques have you been able to use to kind of like thread the needle between being uh, culturally uh, appropriate and, and humble while also um, trying to destigmatize uh, substance use in populations where there is a heavy cultural uh, stigmatization of substance use? Do you want to do that one first or me? <laughs> That's a heavy loaded question, which can take an hour in my answer. Um, so cultural impact, whether it's normalization or stigmatization, plays a big role. So um, a child from Russia may be drinking vodka. A child from Jamaica may have seen a lot of people use you know, marijuana. I grew up in a country where bhang was available on the streets everywhere. So for me, it would be, I mean, bhang is popular now here uh, when I was a child my own teachers after school would go and buy a bhang, you know. So uh, that's, so first let's look at the normalization. Then we talk about the stigmatization. So um, heroin is something which is not actively accepted anywhere because of the impact it does on the society, on the family, on the workforce, on the community. So I'll use that as an example. Um, I'll begin with the same sentence, which we have repeated many times. Meet the patient where they are ready to be met. Meet the family where they are ready to be met. The area where we work in is different from South Atlanta, where there's a different drug use, and they frown upon the drugs Hall County kind of is known for. So every area, not only just the culture, has a norm. And that decides the stigma, that for us, something else may be a stigma. So using that as an example sometimes is a good barrier. The second thing is the impact it has. So the other day, somebody had asked me, how much is normal use for a woman? Surely a woman's normal use is less than a man's normal use. Or in some cultures, it's the other way around, where a woman's heavier use is normal than the man's heavy use, right? So it may be different. So the answer we use is by treating it as a medical disorder. So thankfully now we have audit C. Thankfully now we have the scale called cow. So using these objective things, we can change it from a psychosocial model and introduce the bio part of it and introduce science in it and say that no matter what we think, this may be okay, but if this, this starts happening, it is not okay. So did that answer your question, hopefully? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Huntley, did you want to add something? Um, um, I see families that are here, and I think, um, especially when I have an adolescent presenting with use, meeting with them separately, because there's very different thoughts. Um, but again, as, as, and Dr. Prasad did a good job answering that question, meeting them where they're at, what they're comfortable with, um, but just in seeing, seeing the patients separately from family and also seeing what, what the family's ideas are, especially when seeing an adolescent and what the child is 